Hi, yes, hello everyone, I'm Gavin.js, and today we're going to be taking a look at all of the geometry nodes in geometry nodes, and not just all of the geometry nodes in my breakdown of geometry nodes, but all of the geometry nodes that Blender says are geometry nodes, but only about half of those geometry nodes. I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. To clarify for those of you who are playing at home, we're not going to be using this list that's built into Blender, we're instead going to use my own breakdown, and within that we're only going to be looking at the geometry nodes that are universal to all of the different types of geometry. And of those nodes, we're only going to be looking at the attribute nodes and the read and write nodes. We're going to be taking a look at this small subset of nodes specifically because we have a lot of ground to cover with how much detail I want to go into for each of these nodes. So today most of what we're going to be talking about is going to be related to attributes and the data behind geometry nodes. Because in my opinion, it's important in any form of digital art that you understand the data you're working with. And if you don't know how you're handling the data, you can't effectively manipulate it. So without further ado, let's jump into talking about the most basic node, the index node. So I consider the index node the most basic node because all it does is return a single field that corresponds to the index of whatever element you're looking at, no matter the domain or geometry type. Now where the index node is automatically set by Blender and no two elements can have the same value, the ID node is set by the user and sometimes the random node that sets it for you, and any two elements can have the same value. We can use the set ID node to change the ID, and if we don't do that, then Blender won't really show it to us unless, again, another node creates the ID attribute for us. Generally speaking, the ID defaults to being equivalent to the index, but if you use the set ID node and you set only some of your elements ID by using the selection socket, then any elements that you don't explicitly set will automatically default to zero. Now the normal node is where things get interesting because it sounds fairly straightforward if you're familiar with working with normals, but depending on what domain we're working with, the normal node calculates the normals on our geometry in different ways. Now for anybody who's not familiar with normals in general, this is a term that we've borrowed from physics that refers to the vector that is perpendicular to any given surface. So for faces, that's pretty straightforward. All the node does is calculate the vector that's perpendicular to that face and calls it the normal for that face. But there are lots of times when we need the normal on our vertices instead. So in order to calculate that, Blender automatically takes the average of all of the shared vase of any given vertex and calculates its normal based on that. But let's say we have a free floating point or even just a point that's been extruded from a face and has no shared faces only connected to our mesh by an edge. What happens in those two cases? It turns out what Blender does is take the position of those vertices and uses that for its normal and normalizes that vector. And here I'm using the term normalize to mean to take the magnitude of a vector and set it equal to one. That's the thing with normals, always the magnitude is equal to one, unless we do something to mess that up. So just like for vertices that have shared faces, for edges we take the average of the normals of the two vertices that make up that edge, and that's the normal for the edge. Face corners are the same as faces, same operation. For curve control points, those normals are always perpendicular to the path, and are determined by the twist of the path, but we'll worry about that more when we get to curves. As well as Bezier and NURBS curves. We'll just worry about those when we talk about curves, because according to the Blender manual, things get funky. The position node is also fairly straightforward. It returns the position of any given element. The only thing of note here is that for instances, it returns the origin of each instance. Then of course we have the set position node, which sets the position of any given element. We have two different inputs for this. One is the position, which will reset, fully reset the position of all of our elements. And we also have the offset input, which 
takes into account the current position of all of our elements and offsets it by the given amount. It just makes it easier than trying to offset things using the position input because then you don't have to do as much crazy math to avoid fully resetting all of our positions and having say all of our vertices end up in the same spot. Totally haven't done that before. Next we have the radius node and I wanted to include this here because it works for both curves and points. For points it just reads back the radius that we have to view the points in the display port. We can do things with this value but generally speaking that's all it is is to display them in the viewport. And for curves this reads back the radius on any of our control points. So we'll talk more about the radius value when we talk about curves and points respectively. Then lastly for all of our read write nodes in the general universal geometry nodes we have the selection node and this is new as of 4.0 and enables us to use the current selection that we have in edit mode to operate specifically on that geometry. We then of course have the counterpart to the selection node which is the set selection node which we can use to set the geometry that we want to have selected after running through the operations we've set up in our node group. And of course both of these can only be used in the tool context and not as a modifier. So far we've only talked about the built-in attributes that Blender allows us to read and modify using the nodes that I just mentioned. But we can also define our own attributes and we can do that with the store named attributes and the named attribute nodes. Store name attribute makes it so that we can store any attribute that we want onto all of our elements under any domain which is pretty awesome and we have this nice string input to define whatever name we want for that. More on that in a second. Also we can use the selection input to define which elements should have this attribute and which ones shouldn't. The named attribute node allows us to read back that attribute no matter where it is that we saved it in our node tree. It does however come with an extra little output that tells us whether or not the attribute we're looking for on that specific element exists. Now while I did just imply that we can give our attributes any name we want, that's not explicitly true. We do need to worry about naming collisions and we cannot use this to reset any of our built-in attributes, i.e. the ones that we just talked about and there are a few more. Also we need to be careful about naming collisions. That basically means we can't have two attributes of the same name in the same domain. So naturally given that we can store named attributes we can also remove named attributes. This does exactly what it says. It removes the attribute that has the given name and type. And I think this is a fairly important thing to do, especially if you have a very heavy scene that has a lot of geometry and you've got a bunch of different attributes that are sitting there on your geometry that you may not need anymore. It's important to get rid of that so that it can speed up your processing. Now, in addition to built-in attributes and our specific user-defined named attributes, we also have captured attributes. Really what I should say is anonymous attributes because that's what the capture attribute node does. It captures attributes and saves them as anonymous attributes, which means that they don't show up in the spreadsheet, but they act a lot like named attributes. So here I have a recent example where I've captured my normal values before separating and then setting the position and extruding my mesh. And when I go to extrude the mesh, this is based on the captured normals before all of these changes, because if I hadn't have done that, all of the edges of this mesh would have different normals. It turns out these values don't really change that much in this use case, but this is really the only example I have of working with capture attributes. I usually use store named attribute. And taking a look at our spreadsheet, we know that this is in fact an anonymous attribute because we don't see our normals showing up in the spreadsheet at all, but we do know that we're using the normals to modify this mesh. So now that we've captured or stored all of our attributes, we can finally do something with all of them. And one of those things we can do is blur them using the blur attributes node. This node smooths our attribute values between neighboring elements. And so fittingly, it only works on meshes and curves because those are the only two geometry types that have K 
connected elements, i.e. vertices. How much it mixes all of those values together is based on the number of iterations it does and also on our weights. So instead of having a selection input where we have a boolean operator telling it which elements to do all of this on, we have our weights. And so you can use that to tell it to blur some more than others or to even mask some out, again, to replace that boolean operation. Next we have the domain size node, which returns the number of elements we have of the given geometry type. In order for this to work properly, we need to tell it what type of geometry we're looking at, because it processes everything slash gives you different information depending on what type of geometry you input. For each geometry type, it'll have an output for each domain that is in that geometry type. And for each of those domains, it will give you the number of elements in that domain. The only one that's a little bit different here is the instances, because it'll only give you the number of top level instances. Meaning that if you have nested instances, i.e. if you have an instance that's made of other instances, then it'll only give you the top level number of instances. So say you have five instances and each of them are made up of three instances, it'll only return five in that situation. I hope that's clear. I said instances a lot, but yeah, it'll only give you the top level number of instances. And last, but certainly not least, we have the attribute statistics node. This node is fantastic because a lot of the different outputs that we have here, I didn't think we had access to by default in Blender. I thought we had to do a bunch of complicated math. I even talked about it in the for loops video of trying to get averages of different values. And it's right there. So getting into it, we obviously have our input geometry. That's the geometry we're going to be taking a look at the different attributes of. And of that attribute, we can sort out our different elements by the selection boolean. We have the mean, which is the average of our attributes across all of our elements. We have the median, which is found by sorting all of our attributes from least to greatest and finding the middle number in that set. We have the sum, which is, of course, our total. The minimum of all of our attributes. The maximum of all of our attributes. We have the range, which is, of course, the difference between our maximum and minimum values. And we have our standard deviation, which to put into practical terms for the context we're using it in, it essentially is the amount of variance we have across all of our values. Hi everyone, editor.js here. While watching all of this back, I don't think I did my best job explaining the standard deviation and variance, to be completely honest. And because of that, I'm also struggling to find good visuals to explain this in ways that don't get too, too math heavy and get away from technical art and showing the practical applications in Blender. I think I'm going to make another video where we'll dive into a practical example. So I'll have to come up with some sort of art piece that has a lot of statistics in it. Until then, I'll just leave you all with the definitions for standard deviation and variance as given by the Blender manual. I hope you don't walk away thinking that this note is just confusing because honestly I see a lot of use cases for it, but unfortunately there's just a lot to go into that I don't think I could cover adequately in this video. Anyway, back to it. But with all of that said, that is the first part of all of the nodes talking specifically about the universal geometry nodes. I know we talked a lot about data in this episode and I felt like that was really important to get done up front because a lot of what we're going to be doing in the next one specifically is going to be looking at different operations we can do with all of the different geometry types. And across the rest of this series, we're going to be looking at more operations for geometry. And at the end, we're going to be looking at a lot more utility nodes, which do a lot with attributes. But I wanted to just do this up front because data is incredibly important to understand. And if we don't know how we're manipulating the data, we can't effectively use it. That's at least how I like to view everything. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you've made it this far into the video, I I'd appreciate it if you hit that like and subscribe button. It really does help me out and lets me know that this is worth investing my time and energy into. So with all of that said, I hope this has been helpful and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.